Billy Graham was returning to Charlotte after a speaking engagement, and when he, his plane arrived, there was a limousine there to transport him to his home. And he prepared to get into the limo, and he stopped and started to spoke to the driver. You know, he said, I am 77, 87 years old man, but I never driven a limousine. Never. The driver said, yeah, you can try it. And he asked, can, you, can I try for a drive for a while? Driver said, no problem, have at it. You can try it. And Billy gets into the driver's seat and they head off down to the highway. A short distance away set a rookie state patrol operating his first speeding trap. The long black limo went by him doing 70 miles per hour in zone, a 55 mile zone. The trooper, the trooper pulled out and easily cut the limo and he got out of his patrol car to begin this procedure. The young trooper walked up to, uh, and, uh, walked up to, the, driver, uh, to the driver's door and when the glass was rolled down, he was surprised to see who was driving. You know, he told us, he, he immediately excused himself and went back to his car and called to his supervisor. He told to, to his supervisor, I know, I know, I know, we are supposed to enforce the law, but I also know that important people are given certain courtesies. I need to know what I need to do, what I should to do, because I have stopped a very important person. The supervisor asked, it is a governor? The young trooper said, no, he is more important than that. <laughs> wow. <laughs> His supervisor said, oh, you did you stop president of our state, our, cho uh, our country? Younger Trubis said, no, he is more important than that. <laughs> the supervisor finally asked, well then, who is it? And the young trooper said, I'm pretty sure it is Jesus, because he got Billy Graham for a chauffeur. <laughs> yes, I like the story, all story about Billy Graham, but I like the story. You know, my friends, we are important people. We chosen by the God. We have chosen, he, God he has chosen us to be special, to special for that world, for our community, for our town. People look at us and our life. Look at our words, our relationships, our moods, our attitude, and they form certain expectations about us. The previous story, which gave us good part of irony, also poses to us many, many questions. You know, today I don't want to raise a question uh, uh, about false, false expectations. I believe and I think that all of you understand that when we become Christ's disciples, then per person is bound with a certain expectations. When we say that we are Christians, people expect different kind of behavior from us. You know, when I got baptized uh, and shared it with my friends at school, they said, oh, man, what happened in your life? Is everything bad? What, what? Oh, so you became part of sect? You are now very unenlightened. Are you going to try to drag us into your church? Very often, my friends, when we proclaim that we are Christians or maybe we are Adventists, people react with the following statement. You're limited. 
you're lopsided. Uh, lops, so lopsided. You lopsided, yeah. You waste your time on prayer. You waste your time um, uh, with meetings at church. You are not a funny anymore. Yet, but from another side, they expect something special from us too. Yes, they expect something special. And I remember one story from my uh, school time uh, when I was bullied, uh, bullied and I, as a boy, yes, defended myself by hitting back. I was met with immediate reaction. You're a Christian. We thought you are not supposed to hit back. Yes, from one side, they see us as a uh, uh, limited person, yes, P persons. But from another side, they expect something special from our behavior. People associate Christian, a Christian as a certain type of behavior, behavior. And when we don't live up to these expectation, expectations, we don't shy our light as we should. Yeah, it was my school when I was at school. <laughs> um, next story, and I would like to remind you one, one more story about some expectations about us. My brother, he was pastor and minister in district where he had uh, three churches, small churches. It was a small town uh, in two villages, uh, and he had three, three, three small churches there. When my brother came to one of these villages, they told him that they really wanted to have here to hold a huge evangelistic series. We would like to save all of that people, they said. Many of them at this church were Adventists for a long time. And when he started to go from home to home, you know, to share and find people for Bible lessons, who... People did not receive him as a joyfully. As soon as they heard what church he is from, they would say, no, we never will come to your church. He asked, why? What happened? Why you have that reaction? And, you know, we started explaining. Oh, so you are from the church where one is always drunk? Or the other has an ongoing life suit with his neighbor to get a chunk of his property and he offend, have offended his neighbors many, many times with bad words. Or where a wife from one family stole a husband from another family and left their, uh, her kids for husband. In such small group, People are familiar with each other and know the affair of each other. Ah, uh, I would like to say that I don't want the church to feel false guilty. And we don't need to feel, uh, false, uh, feel false guilty. After all, we go to the church for what? Because we need healing, yes? We, we come to God because we want to be cured from sin. But, but at the same time, Christ says that people will know you, that you are my disciples, and you will have what among you? You will have love. And that love you will show through your worship, God, through your relationship with neighbors, through your attitude to work, you will show that love. You will have, you will have your love among you. As a church, you're, uh, you're the light. Christ said, you're the light and you are on the display. You're the people whom the world ties their expectations. And these expectations, my friends, are is God-like life. Amen? Say amen. God's like life. We need it. We need to talk about that. And today... We return to our verse and theme, the daily pursuit. 
that we started a couple Sabbaths ago. And today we will talk about another spiritual habit that we need to develop, that we need to develop and make stronger. If you remember my introduction for uh, my previous sermon, uh, for this series, I, we talked about fitness for our spiritual inner person. We need to have that fitness. And today we will talk what we need to develop again or maybe what uh, else we need to develop. Last time we talked about we need to become an example at speech, um, example uh, in our words. And I would like to read that verse with you. First Timothy, this is our main verse for today and for all of the series. First uh, Timothy chapter 4, and we will read verse 12. Please open with me, and we will read together. Let no one despise you for your youth, but set the believers an example in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, in purity. Powerful, my friends. Last time, as I mentioned, we talked about our words, about our speech. And today, we will talk about how we need to become an example in our conduct. And let's look at the word conduct and its meaning. Why is it important to do this? Because when we read about it, we could think of many things that this word means. And... Um, uh, and um, I would like uh, to give you some, uh, some meanings of, of the word uh, conduct. Here is the contemporary meaning of this word. First, conduct is a manner in which a person behaves, especially on particular occasion or in particular context. And second meaning of that word, uh, conduct is the action or manner of managing an activity or organization. And an example of conduct is, a, is to leading meeting. An example of conduct is to lead an orchestra, to lead uh, or guide somebody or group of people. But in the Greek, we have find some interesting word that called, or we can pronounce, anastrophe. Anastrophe. And uh, when, apostle, when, we, when we see that word here, conduct, we have that word anastrophe. And what kind, what meaning we have and what, uh, what that word ha has uh, meaning for us and how we can translate that word. Behavior, conduct, dealing with the man, life and manner of life. And this word anastrophe used 13 times in New Testament, 13 times. It is used as, as a behavior. I don't, uh, I, I don't know, I don't, I don't see. Okay, maybe, yeah, I need to back. Okay, just a second. Yeah, it is used as a behavior six times. As a conduct four times. Manner of life two times. And way of life just one time. And now let's look at how this word was used. How context adjectives, adverbs, and are used in connection with this word. And we will understand what is Apostle Paul and, um, want to call us. And, you know, I, I, I read all of that verses many, many times and had some studies. And I see this word is used in two kinds of context or in two categories. And first category... First category uh, where this word, word was used is a former way, former way of life. And, I, and you have some examples. You can see, yeah, some examples of, of that word. And now we will read all of that verses and we'll see how Apostle Paul is, uh, he's using, he's used all of that uh, um, verses just explain one thought or one idea and he used uh, uh, that word anastrophe. Please open with me Galatians chapter 1 and we will read verse 13. Galatians chapter 1 verse 13. Yeah, we will open all 13 verses 
because this is important for our reflection, for our study. Uh, Galatians chapter 1, verse 13. For you... Okay, you have it. For you uh, have heard of my former life in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of church violently and tried to destroy it. You can see that where uh, this, this word, anastrophe, Apostle Paul used uh, um, like former life or former life in Judaism. This word life, we can translate like anastrophe. His former life. Paul is, you, is saying, look at my former way of life. It was without Jesus. It was before I met with Jesus. One more idea from Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 22. Please open with me and we will read together. At 4.22. Similar idea. Similar idea. To put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life. And it's corrupt through deceif de uh, deceitful desires. Again. Former way of life. It was before we met Jesus Christ. It was, uh, that conduct, the type of conduct was before he met Jesus Christ or we met Jesus Christ. One more verse from book of um, uh, first, first, uh, Second Peter, excuse me, Second Peter chapter 2 and verse 7. Open and we will read together. Second Peter 2 7. <clears throat> and if he rescued righteous, a righteous lot, greatly distressed by the sensational conduct of the wicked. Here, Apostle pa Peter, yes, he talks about a lot who lived among people with immoral lifestyle. One more example. For, uh, First Peter chapter 1 and verse 18. First Peter chapter 1 and verse 18. Knowing that you were ransomed from the uh, futile, futile ways inherited from the, your forefathers, not which perishable things such as silver or gold. This verse says that we were bought from the empty way. In some different translation, you can find that word empty way. Empty way and a way of life of your ancestors. This is the first category. This is the first group of verses. Former way um, our former way, for a way without Jesus Christ. Second, second category where we, where this word is used is in a lifestyle after the conversion. And I would like um, to open the first verse with you, uh, first, first Peter, first Peter chapter one and verse fifteen. Where in that in those verses we, we will find how. We became, we became Christians, or somebody became Christian, and his lifestyle demonstrates that fact. Okay, a uh, few, uh, few verses. Uh, verses. First Peter chapter 1 and uh, verse 15. And verse 3 uh, and chapter 3, 11, it's the same idea, but we will read it. Uh, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Chapter 3, 11. Open with me and we will see a similar idea. Let him... Uh, excuse me. Ah, oh, 2 Peter. 2 Peter 3, 11. Uh, Since all these things are those, those to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness? You are to be holy in your conduct. In the first place, Peter is saying that you are 
called to be holy. One more example. One more example. In 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 12. Um, yes, verse 12. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you as Evil doors, they may see your good deeds and glorify God of the day of visitation. What you need to have? Good? Keep conduct among the Gentiles honorable. Uh, and verse uh, chapter 316. Having a good con consistency so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. In that, in that verse, we see word behavior and it's same like conduct, anastrophe. Again, anastrophe. This is the same word used in, a, in a, uh, used Apostle Paul and Apostle Peter. And you must be, have honorable lifestyle. These two verses have the same idea. Since we live among unbelievers, we must show a lifestyle that would praise our Lord. Amen? Amen. Go ahead. We also have three verses with additional, with additional meaning or additional understanding about the word of conduct. And first place that I would like to show you, Hebrew chapter 13, verse 7. Please open with me and we will read. We will read together. 13, 7. Um, 7 yes. Remember your leaders. Those who spoke to you the word of God, consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. We should reflect the lifestyle of our mentors, maybe pastors, teachers, I don't know, our mentors, leaders of our church. Next, uh, just like they lived in faith, it becomes an example for us. And as an example uh, from book of James, book of James verse 3 uh, chapter 3 and verse 13. Uh, yeah, almost done, my friends. Who is wise and understanding among you? Question for us. Who is wise and understanding among you? But his good conduct, let him show his work, works in the meekness of wisdom. James is posing a very straightforward forward, forward challenge. If you think of yourself wise, then show it with your exemplary conduct. In other word, words, show it in your life. And uh, the last verse we will look at is in 1 uh, Peter chapter 3. Back to Peter. 1 Peter chapter 3. And two first verses from that chapter. Be uh, Okay, <clears throat> likewise, likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands, so that even if some do not obey the words, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives, uh, when they see your respectful and poor conduct. Again, two times, yes, that word, anastrophe, our wives, Love this verse, yes? My wife, she loves <laughs> when I read. <laughs> Especially in some discussion, <laughs> I have argument. <laughs> but a converted and believing woman should also show good conduct in her life. Because in this way, she will obtain her husband for the kingdom of God. Modern psychology uh, encouraged to save yourself. But Paul is calling to do something different. To think of people we live with and lead them with our moral conduct. We see that the word conduct is used both uh, as a lifestyle before we met Jesus Christ and after the conversion. Thanks to these verses, thanks for these verses, we see what this love style was like. The surrounding of Lot, Lot, the immoral lifestyle of Sodom and Gomorrah. 
Apostle Paul was rejecting Jesus Christ as a Savior. Epistles of Ephesians give us the whole picture of immoral lifestyle that is unacceptable. Before conversion, the lifestyle was completely, was completely, uh, completely, completely different. Was completely different. Uh, it is was it it was uh, immoral. Um, it shows that in all your spheres of one's life, God was missing. We lived godless lives. And now the author is saying that we live a life that reflects our God. So, what is that change, my friends? What is that change? What happens at the moment of conversion? The moment connecting before and after. The moment, what happened in the moment of conversion? What becomes the factor that does not change my plans for Sabbath or for weekend, but completely change my behavior, my lifestyle? It is not just changing something, you know, in your schedule. It is, just, it's, it is not just going to church. It is not just changing your plans for Sabbaths. A change in behavior is affecting all spheres of a human being. His, converge, uh, his conversations, his business, his conflicts, attitudes towards health and diet, Future plans, life priorities, everything had changed. Absolutely everything completely changing. So what is happening in that moment before and after? And for that I would like to open First, P uh, First Peter chapter 1 and we will read we, we read uh, verse 18 but we, we will read both 18 and 19. Knowing that you were trans uh, ransomed from the empty ways inherited from your forefathers, for 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 not which perishable things such as silver or, go or, or gold, but, this is important, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of lamp without blemish of spot. The answer is here. What is happening? Answer is here. We are redeemed by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Amen? This is the key moment because, moment because, G, because accepting Jesus Christ into our lives, reali uh, realization, the price that was paid for my salvation changed my life, changed my life from former way of life to the holy way of lives. Through to holy way of lives, the change that takes place is change that happens in my heart. It changed my mind, my lifestyle. It is a change that touches my mindset and priorities that control my life. You know, sometimes it happens, unfortunately, that everything would change just my schedule for Sabbath. Yeah, I have this entertainment to come to church. Nothing more. Nothing changed in my life. You know, it, understanding that I am a new creation in Jesus Christ leads to change in my manner of living. No, now my, my main priority is to live a holy life. God is calling us to have a high standard. And if, uh, uh, again, uh, First Peter chapter 1 and verse 15, but as we who called you is holy, you also holy in all your conduct. Also holy in all your conduct. Peter is saying that we are called to follow the way of holy God. After the conversion, Jesus is our Savior. 
we determine ourselves to completely different quality of life. Psychologists, can you help me, Tom, a little bit with, uh, with that? Can you move forward our slides? M more, more, couple more, yeah. And one more again, and one more again. <laughs> yes, psychologists are saying that everyday life is controlled by people's convictions. Our life is formed by our convictions. And it is really so. Convictions declare the fruits of uh, our life will bring, you know. Uh, declare our values that we have priorities. This is what they teach, you know, at the seminars, how to become billionaires. Did you visit some seminars, how you became billionaires? Have you been there or not? No? We need to change something. <laughs> I, I, I visited a couple times uh, just, you know, to understand how I can find my American dream. But nothing changed, you know. They tell you that, that you are already must think of yourself as a successful and wealthy person. F wealthy person. My friends, my friends, my dear brothers and sisters, from the moment when we accept Jesus Christ as our Savior, our mindset and convictions changed. It changed someone's mindset from I am former alcoholic. Now I am not, um, uh, now I am former liar. Now I am former abuser. Or maybe I had jealous for everybody. Or something else. Maybe some bad words from my mouth. To a conviction that now I am for, I'm a new person in Jesus Christ. Now, the solving the conflicts, conflict, I will behave as a holy person. I will behave as a holy person. I even drive with a halo on my head. Yes? Because I am a new person. Uh, now, at work, I behave as a holy, holy person. And if you remember 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 12, be an example in your personal life, in your behavior, in your conduct. This is our call today. This is God's call to us today. In the conclusion, I would like to tell you a story, story of a person who understood and believed as a new creation. For me, it's important to have some slides for you because it will remind something. Maybe you read before, you heard something, maybe you watched some videos about that. It's a period of our country story, a story of our country. But, you know, that woman, she was convicted that a converted Christian show it in all circumstances of life. It is a certain mode of behavior and is a reflection, uh, is a reflecting of Christ, of our Christ. She were, was persecuted by the Bolsheviks for faith. If you see those people, yes, it will remind you who is Bolsheviks, yes. And she was taken from her husband, from her small children, and thrown into the prison. Now, what you need to know is that is the Stalin's concentration camp, camps. In Stalin's concentration camps, more people died than in Second World War. 35 million. This is a fact of our story. Barracks in these camps sometimes help from 100 
to 400 people. They live together in the same place. It's, it looks like, yeah, some, she was uh, persecuted and uh, it was Barak. It was, looks like in Siberia and some, some different areas. <sighs> there were not any toilets even. So they had to go in these barracks. People lived as animals. Because people killed uh, even over a small piece of bread or a piece of sugar. If you uh, familiar with Solzhenitsyn or Varlam Shalamov, uh, those uh, wrote a some books about, about that concentration camps and Stalin's regime. But for us, important, when people died, people were thrilled because as soon as a person died, they took off her clothes and put it on, uh, on them, on themselves. And people, my friends, died every day. Every day. For a guard, to kill a person was a sh at a sort of entertainment. Entertainment, sorry. The cold, hunger, and hard work made life unbelievable, unbearable. However, when even there, the, uh, this our sister was a being and praising the Lord. She was there. She would not work on Sabbath, which, mean, which many times treated her life. She would be stripped naked uh, and put on, uh, in the snow to freeze. And you know, in Siberia, it's minus, minus 40 and something like that. But the most amazing story of deliverance was when she was stripped down completely naked and thrown into a cell with just men inside. Now, these were all criminal men. Criminal men. In cell, of course, such would have been the worst punishment possible. You, you, you can even imagine, imagine what was happening inside of her. In the cells that she was thrown, it was a very, uh, very authority figure with, uh, with the criminals. A criminal of, of, criminal of all criminals. Everyone would listen to him and be scared of him. By the mercy of God, he said to everyone in that cell, whoever will touch her will deal with me. We are here because we are criminals. She is here because of her faith. Nobody touched her because... Um, throughout her imprisonment. And we should understand that she did not deserve it to be there. Yes? She was believing in God like we now. And she got thrown into prison because of it. She was faithful in prison. And again, she is being punished and thrown before human with animal desires. In such moment, my friends, you cannot tell yourself to hold your, your face and do the right things. You know, sometimes I can go to church. Okay, I'm ready for, for everything to be smile. In that moment, you cannot be ready. You cannot be ready because this is a completely out of your control. You cannot control yourself in a situation. And to remain faithful is possible only because is it part of your nature? Is it part of your being, my friends? Praise the Lord, we are not in a concentration camp today. But we do live among people who do not, who do know, uh, don't know God, uh, uh, who don't know God. Their lives are based on rejection of God. On God. God is asking us to become a good example 
in all circumstances to live holy lives. Be an example in your conduct. Amen? I would like to pray with you. Our Heavenly Father, you are amazing God. We praise you. We sing for you. We talk with you. And we never, maybe not every time understand your mercy to us in our life. Your life, love, how you touch, how you control, how you help us, save us. But today we would like to say praise, praise, praise and praise you. Because you saved us. Your blood. You paid that price for our salvation. And we pray and ask you. Give us this power. To live as a holy person in this world. To show your life. To show your lifestyle. Your values for this world. We pray, be with us and bless us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.